going into a lot of details. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> cannot really say diversity is good for populism or diversity is bad for populism. But what we can say is that diversity is a tactical resource that populist parties or movements can deploy to mobilize electorate. Drawing on the work of um, a sociologist, uh, Rogers Brubecker at the UCLA, um, it is probably also useful to think the idea of the people uh, at two levels. So on the one hand, populists have a vertical construction of the idea of the people, where the people, the morally superior people, are posited against a corrupt elite. On the other hand, they also construct people in a rather horizontal way as against outsiders. In the case of continental Europe, if you will, um, you see that a lot of the populist discourse is coupled with an anti-immigrant discourse. So, and the populists are complaining about the elites because elites are defined as cosmopolitan, they're wel welcoming migrants in, thus they position themselves against a cosmopolitan elite, thus see the migration-related diversity as a threat to the, the well-being or the culture or the tradition of the society. But if you look at how um, a populist leader such as Erdogan used diversity in diversity in his um, rhetoric, that was very different, especially during his second office between 2007 until 2012, 2013. There you see he actually used kind of like an inclusive um, form of rhetoric that enabled him also gather support from very different sectors of society, including the liberal, liberals and the leftists and so on. But what united these, these diverse set of groups was um, the, in a way, their opposition to the ruling um, hegemonic structures, such as the military um, and so on. So in the Turkish example, diversity played out very differently from the way it played out in the European case. Thus, we can't really say that the relationship between diversity and populism is a predetermined one, but it's very much shaped by um, the context. Turkey has a very complicated history, to say the least. Coming out of the multi-religious and the multi-ethnic Ottoman Empire, the founding elites in the early 20th century imagined a very homogeneous, ethnically and religiously homogeneous nation, Turkish nation. Thus, the main elements of this nation was mainly defined by being a Turk and being a Sunni Muslim. Thus, whoever didn't fit into that categorization, including, for instance, Kurds, including Alevis, including non-Muslims, such as the Greek Orthodox, Armenians, Jews, Assyrians uh, were left to the margins, if not left in the outside of the of the national boundaries. Military is seen as a responsible actor, if you will, um, for enacting this homogeneous imagination on the nation. So what Erdogan did during the especially during his second office was to unite these different groups together on the basis of an anti-establishment discourse. Thus, if the establishment is uh, telling you that Turkish nation is homogenous, Erdogan was saying that, well, as a matter of fact, Turkish nation is quite heterogeneous and we should embrace that heterogeneity. So we have an, like, we have a, we should embrace that multicultural heritage. The limit to Erdogan's and any populist leader's uh, inclusionary rhetoric lies in whether they are able to accept demands coming from different parts within society. Inclusive rhetoric is one thing, and being able to respond to collective demands or individual demands coming from these various parts of the society is another thing. And there was definitely a gap that is primarily to do with uh, what happened in June 7 uh, parliamentary elections.
So that was, in a way, the second moment when Erdogan had to make a choice. The first choice was made during Gezi, when he responded with violence, the violent suppression of the, of the demonstrators. And the ch second choice was made on 7th of June in 2015 parliamentary elections, when he, in a way, didn't recognize the election outcomes and went into a snap election in November 2015.